Welcome to Cambridge House Live. I'm Bridget Anderson and I'm joined by Peter Schiff here at the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference. You are the CEO and Chief Global Strategist at Euro Pacific Capital. Also, fairly recent author of a book, The Real Crash, America's Coming Bankruptcy. Nice to have you here. Thanks for having me on. And let's start off with your book about America's coming bankruptcy. Give me your overview of where you think the American economy is. Well, first of all, it's not, it's my most recent book. The first book I wrote came out in February of 2007, and that was called Crash Proof, How to Profit from the Coming Economic Collapse. Mm -hmm. The reason this book is titled The Real Crash is because the economic collapse that I wrote about in my 07 book hasn't happened yet. In that book, I did write about the housing bubble and why I believed it was going to burst or why I believed there was a bubble. You were and, right on the leading edge of that. And I wrote about the ensuing financial crisis uh, that would result from the bursting of the housing bubble. And so I did forecast the Great Recession that you know began in, in 2007. Uh, but more important than that was what I believed would come next. And that hasn't happened yet. That's the real crash. Because what really was uh, worrying me was I was afraid the government would respond to the financial crisis by doing more of the same policies that caused it, which is more deficit spending, more cheap money, more central banking and central planning. And as a result, I think the U.S. economy is now poised for a much bigger collapse. I think that what's coming is a sovereign debt crisis and a currency crisis uh, that will make the financial crisis of 08 you know, look like you know, the proverbial Sunday school picnic I think that it's going to be much worse than what Europe has been going through. And do you think that uh, investors and Americans are prepared for that? No, not at all. So how do you tell them that? How do you prepare people for that? Well, you know, in many cases, uh, the tendency is to shoot the messenger. So a lot of people, you know, don't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think I've been able to get some credibility uh, with a minority of, uh, of, the, of the public. Uh, we have a lot of uh, clients of my brokerage firm that are investing with me, and we're trying to help people at least protect their savings. I think uh, the biggest threat is to the value of the dollar. And so a lot of Americans who depend on the dollar, uh, depend on its value for their standard of living, people who are retired or people who have accumulated a lot of financial wealth, they need to take action quickly to divest themselves. Uh, so we recommend that clients own gold and silver, uh, we help them invest abroad, including up here in Canada. Uh, we buy foreign stocks, foreign currencies. Uh, we look for ways to diversify globally to reduce uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the reliance on the U.S. dollar. So you were at the leading edge of seeing what was happening in the real estate market and subprime. So, and now you're, you're calling for, for this situation, the basic collapse of the, the currency and a meltdown in the economy. What do you see that maybe others don't see, or how do you read that? I don't know. I, 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 I haven't bought into the, all the Keynesian uh, nonsense, so I think I, I, I think a little bit more clearly. It's not that I'm smarter than, than, than everybody else. You're I, looking I, for different things. Well, my my, my judgment isn't so clouded by a lot of that dogma, and, and so I think my head's on straight, and I think I can think logically uh, about things. I mean, if you go back to the housing bubble, and you know, so many people just got caught up in the idea that housing prices always rose, that they never bothered to figure what might happen if they fell. But to me, it seemed obvious that housing prices would fall eventually. And since I understood that, then I can connect the dots to see what was going to happen. But if you were operating under the premise that real estate prices could never fall, if you, know, if you drank so much of that Kool-Aid, then it didn't matter you, you, you know, you, how many how much data you got, you, you, you still couldn't figure out what was going to happen. And I think people still have this view of the U.S. as this you know, supremacy of our economy, of the almighty dollar. Uh, we're the, you know, the biggest economy in the world. And, and they've lost track of you know, why America was successful in the first place and why America of today bears no resemblance to America of the past. And that right now we're just living on literally on borrowed time. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're not producing. We have gigantic uh, trade deficits. We have enormous uh, liabilities, budget deficits, national debt. Uh, you know, we're borrowing from every country in the world to live beyond our means. And we're now so addicted to debt that the highest interest rate we can afford is zero. And today, 
President Obama being inaugurated and we're dealing with another four years. Do you see any kind of uh, easing of any of this in the next four years? No, I think he, he might wish that he didn't win the re-election because I think he's going to have a tough time. He thinks he's going to build his legacy you know, in, the, in his second term. Uh, this is when it's going to hit the fan. You know, also today he was... Um, uh, you know, he appointed some new uh, cabinet officers. He signed one of them. We're getting a new secretary of the treasury, and I, as I'm watching him sign this paper, I'm thinking to myself, Why do we even have a secretary of the treasury? We don't have a treasury. There's no treasure. We we have debt. We we need to have a secretary of the debt, and really, the job of the secretary of the treasury is basically to convince the world to loan us money, even though we're broke. And even though we're threatening to default if we can't borrow more. So what's the answer then? Increasing taxes? Is that part well, of the answer? Well, that's not the right answer. Hmm. But increasing taxes are better than increasing deficits. But the problem is the politicians don't want to tell the voters that they have to pay for government. I mean, they're willing to raise taxes on the 1%. But unfortunately, the rich are already overtaxed. They're bearing a disproportionately high burden of the tax. And raising taxes on the wealthy through increasing the marginal rate of income tax is probably going to backfire because the wealthy just won't work as hard. They don't. We won't produce as much. They won't pay as much taxes. They won't hire as many people. Many people might just retire. So if we're going to have more taxes, we need more taxes on the middle class. But the middle class is already struggling uh, with this economy. So the, the real answer is not taxes, mm -hmm. but cuts in government spending. And not just, you know, trivial cuts around the, the edges. We need real deep cuts. We need to abolish entire agencies and departments. We need to cut, not reform entitlements. We actually need to cut them. Yet People governments are, keep growing and they're going in the opposite direction. They're growing and we're already broke. And so we have to have bigger and bigger debts to finance them. But meanwhile, it's un, it's un, you know, we can't finance them. The, the Federal Reserve is now monetizing the majority of the debt. Something like 90% of the new Treasury in issuance is being taken up by the Fed. And the Fed can only do that as long as the world is willing to warehouse those dollars. And dollars, you know, are piling up uh, in, you know, in sovereign wealth funds or in, you know, uh, 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 reserves, dollar reserves in central banks all around the world. We're exporting our inflation to other countries instead of real stuff. And so uh, we're exporting our problems. And it, it's, it's, it's a big burden on the global economy to have to shoulder, to have to subsidize the United States. Okay, speaking of burdens, what happens in the event that is interest rates rise? Well, when interest rates rise, the party's over. And that's why uh, the Fed won't raise them. Now, they're going to come up with every kind of excuse why they're not going to raise them, except the truth. The truth is that we can't handle it. The U.S. economy is so addicted, I said, to cheap money, that the highest rate we can afford is zero. Because if interest rates went up, all those big banks that we bailed out with the TARP, they would fail again. And the problem is, because we bailed them out, they got even bigger. And the federal government, the only reason the federal government can service the debt is because the rates are, are so low. If interest rates went up and America had to pay a legitimate rate of interest on the debt we've already accumulated, we couldn't even pay the interest on the debt, let alone retire any of the principal. Uh, so in order to keep the world from recognizing that solvency problem, the Fed keeps interest rates low. But the only way they can do that is to keep printing money, which eventually is going to crash the dollar. Pretty much back right into a corner you can't get out of then. Yeah, I mean, we are going to be stuck between a rock and a hard place. The Fed is going to have to choose between destroying the dollar and deflating the bubble. Uh, and, but, you know, politically, they will resist doing the right thing as long as possible. You know, because as long as there's a way out, they're not going to do the right thing. And, and so right now, because we can borrow money, because the world is willing to pull dollars, we can get away with these huge deficits. But at some point, uh, a crisis is going to force us uh, to reluctantly do what needs to be done. But because we waited so long to do it, the problem is that much bigger. And is it that much bigger as well because we look what's happening in Europe and the Eurozone crisis and the two then converging? Well, the Eurozone crisis, ironically, was the best thing we had going for us because, because people thought that Europe was in worse shape than America, which was right. wrong. But people were buying treasuries to get out of Eurozone debt, even though we owe more money. I mean, if we were part of the Eurozone, right, the world would be worried about us. We would be one of the pigs. We might even be the biggest pig. Mm. But 
The fact is we're printing the reserve currency, and so nobody is worried about America defaulting because they know that we can print. But that is the problem. And pretty soon the world is not going to be worried about default, but worry about printing. Because really, it's a distinction without a difference. Not getting paid back and being paid back in worthless money is the same thing. And ultimately, that's what's going to happen if we keep printing. The money's not going to have any value. So for investors then, if they see what's going on here and they, they believe what you're saying and they see the, the implications of that, what do they do next? What are they supposed to do with their money now to, to remain in, in, a, in a pretty good place and to find Listen, opportunities? Get it out of the dollar <laughs> if, it, if it's in the U.S. dollar. Uh, but I think you have to look at some of the emerging economies, look at Southeast Asia, look at countries that are doing it right or at least making fewer mistakes. And so you want to have countries that don't have a big entitlement class mentality where people aren't voting for something from government. Uh, you want people that save money, don't spend money. Governments that have uh, you know, budgets that are in balance where the government is a smaller part of the GNP, uh, where you have trade surpluses, current account surpluses, and invest in that part of the world. You know, in, invest where there's going to be real economic growth. The people who are saving today, you know, they're going to have a bright tomorrow. In America, we, we sacrifice our future to indulge the here and now. Mm -hmm. uh, but we are setting ourselves up for a huge fall. And the political ramifications are very ominous for the United States because the, the impetus in Washington is to continue to do the wrong thing and continue to br blame capitalism for failures of socialism. And every time government interferes in the economy and it creates a problem, they always blame it on capitalism, even though capitalism would have prevented the problem. And so every time there's a crisis, we get more government. Well, we're staring at the biggest crisis yet. And it, it, is, it is a very frightening proposition about how much government we theoretically could end up with in America, which will be very destructive. So some people are seeing this and then they're putting their money into gold because it's a safe bet. And in fact, you were the one who saw gold going to 5,000. Do you still see that? You no, know, I've been saying that since it was <laughs> under 300. So you still so, believe that? Yeah, and, you know, and it might actually go a lot higher than that uh, because we're still, per, you know, pursuing these inflationary policies, and you know, eventually, who knows? I mean, there might not be a number large enough to describe what the price is going to be, at least in terms of U.S. dollars. You know, it might not go that high. It won't in, in Canadian dollars or some other currency. Canadian dollars? <laughs> good as American dollars right now, are they? Par anyway, so well, how in what time frame are you talking about? Do you see uh, five thousand or do you see three thousand even? I don't know. You know, I, it should, as far as I'm concerned, it should probably already be at twenty five hundred or three thousand, maybe higher. Not not only based on how much inflation has already been created, but based on how much cr inflation is going to be created. The gold market should be looking forward and recognizing this. I mean, they are going to be printing so much money, not just in America, but all around the world. And, you know, it's easy to print money. It's not that easy to mine gold. I mean, first of all, you got to find it. And the cost of mining has gone up dramatically. Well, and some of the in, jurisdictions in, aren't very stable either. No. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of the areas where gold is are very unstable. I mean, look at South Africa, which used to be uh, the world's largest gold producer. Look at the political reasons. They're now China is the biggest gold producer. But how much of that gold is ever going to make it out of China? None of it. China doesn't even export. They import gold, well, you know, even though they're you, the world's biggest producer. I want to ask you a little bit about China because, uh, you know, a year or so ago, there was some concern about some of the numbers coming out of China. Were they real? What's really happening? Growth has slowed a bit. Is there a flag for you about it, uh, when you look at China, what's going on there? I, I, I don't look at government numbers. I, mean, I, don't, I, I think governments lie, I mean, pretty much all around. But, I mean, what doesn't lie are the facts, you know, and I can go into stores and I can look at all this merchandise that was made in China. So there's real economic activity going on there. Just go to China. Just look around. You can see what's happening uh, in, in the country. And, and if you've been there you know, in the past, you can see the changes. You can see cities coming up. You see how the people dress. You look at the restaurants. You, you can see the vibe in the cities. Uh, so there's real economic growth. Living standards are rising in China. You know, whereas in America, they talk about all of our economic growth and all of our productivity. Meanwhile, our trade deficit gets bigger and bigger and bigger. We keep going deeper into debt. How can we be productive if we're going if we're going getting poor? At least China is getting richer. Look at the look at the the, the net foreign exchange reserves. The Chinese have over three trillion dollars. They earned all those reserves. Their economy was productive enough that they produced those surpluses. America's economy is a basket case. We're hemorrhaging red ink. So I don't care what the government says. Just look at reality. You know, look at the output 
of the countries. Which country is operating in the black and which country is operating in the red? Do you think, Peter, that perception is starting to change that because of people like you and opinions like yours that people are starting to take a different look at the, the U.S. economy, the U.S. administration and asking some questions? Some people are. I mean, certainly in the minority. I think the, the majority uh, of the investors or certainly the institutional class of investors, people that are paid a lot of money to manage other people's money, are still clueless. I think the same people who were buying all the dot-com stocks at the peak, the same people who were buying mortgages and houses at the peak, you know, they're the same people that are calling the shots now, investing the big money, and they still don't understand what's going on. You know, they still look at maybe the financial crisis of 08 as some random 100-year flood that nobody could have predicted, um, and, and they still don't understand what caused it and why this next crisis is going to be bigger. You know, in fact, they just released the Fed minutes from um, 2007. And none of these guys saw this crisis coming, even though the recession had already started, uh, even though the housing bubble had already burst. Uh, and these are the same guys that are in power today. And these are the same guys that are telling us that we don't have to worry about anything. So what's the top thing you're telling investors for 2013? Well, just it, it's not it's it's not uh, it's not as rosy as the as as the mainstream spin. The economy is not recovering. We're sicker than ever. We just don't know it yet. You know, there's a lot of talk about Lance Armstrong, right? Because he, yeah, yeah. you know, well, we got the Lance Armstrong economy. You know, I don't know why we are so critical of Lance Armstrong. We ought to just erect a monument to him. We ought to maybe put his image on our money, because our whole economy is based on artificial stimulus. And it's all about Lance Armstrong. Peter, thank you very much. Really interesting conversation. Thanks for having me on.